Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Pavel Levitsky. I'm the Associate Director of the European Studies Center. And on behalf of mine and European Studies Center and Director Randall Halle, whom you can see on the grid, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to another iteration of our Conversations on Europe. We have a very hot topic today, which is elections in Poland that took place last uh, Sunday. And um, I hope for a you know, interesting and uh, lively discussion. This event is co-sponsored by the European Studies Center and our colleagues from uh, the Center for uh, East European, Eurasian and Russian Studies. Um, and we have a great lineup today and let me introduce uh, our speakers today. Professor Jan Kubik is a professor of political science at Rutgers University and a professor of Slavonic and East European studies at the University College of London. His main research is the relationship between politics and power and culture. He studies uh, how power is exercised through a, a, such ostensibly apolitical means, such as rhetoric, celebrations, rituals, artistic performances, in addition to observing economic dominance and institutional control. He is also doing research on social movements and protest politics. He's third area of interest is political anthropology and its relationship with comparative politics. Empirically, these issues are, are exemplified in his research on Poland, East and Central Europe, and Western part of the former Soviet Union. His research, uh, his recent work has been uh, concentrated on regime transition and process of democratization, the politics of memory, the rise of right-wing populism, and the interpreted interpretative interpretive <laughs> and ethnographic methods in political science um, research for which he has received a grant from European Research Council. He has been a vice president and president of the Associ Association for Slavic, East European and Eurasian Studies. His publication includes several books such as Anthropology and Political Science um, published at Oxford uh, at Berghain Books, together with Miron Aronov, or awarded Rebellious Civil Society, Popular Protests and Democratic Consolidation in Poland, 1989 till 1993, published at University of Michigan Press, together with Grzegorz Eckert. He has also published books on memory, social justice, and power in post-socialist Europe. His articles were published in such journals as Sociological Forum, National Papers, East European Politics and Societies, Comparative Politics, and many others. Our second speaker is uh, Professor Monika Nalepa. She's a professor of political science at the University of Chicago. Her research is focused on post-communist Europe, transitional justice, parties, legislators, and again, uh, theoretic approaches to comparative politics. Her first book, Skeletons in the Closet, Transitional Justice in Post-Communist Europe, was published in the Cambridge Studies in Comparative Politics and received the Best Book Award from the Comparative Democratization section of the APSA and the Leon Epstein Outstanding Book Award from the Political Organizations and Parties section of APSA. Her second book, After Authoritarianism, Transitional Justice and Democratic Stability was published at Cam Cambridge University Press in August, 2022. She has published her, her research in Journal of Politics, Quality, uh, Quarterly Journal of Political Science, Post-Soviet Affairs, Perspective on Politics, the Journal of Comparative Politics, and many others. Her current work, uh, centers on how transitional justice mechanisms contribute to the quality of democracy. Before working at the University of Chicago, she taught at Rice University and the University of Not Notre Dame. Professor Nalepa has also uh, held prestigious fellowship at the Harvard University of Scholars and the Center for Study of Democratic Politics at Princeton University. Our third speaker tonight today is uh, Dr. Michał Kotnarowski. He's a sociologist and political science scholar employed at the Institute of Philosophy and Sociology of the Polish Academy of Sciences as an assistant professor. His research interests include electoral behavior, international comparative studies, political culture, and social research methodology. 
He has authored and co-authored several books and more than a dozen of articles. He has published in Electoral Studies, Party Politics, Acta Politica, Communist and Post-Communist Studies, European Social Sociological Review. He is affiliated with the Graduate School of Social Research at the Institute of Philosophy and Sociology of the Polish Academy of Sciences as a qualitative methods, as a qualitative methods and social research instructor. Since November 2021, he has been the national coordinator for Poland in the European Social Survey Project. He has held fellowships from the National Science Center and Academia Nazionale dei Lincei. He is a member of editorial board of the uh, Kultura and Społeczeństwo, Culture and Society Journal. Now, we asked our speakers to give a 10 minute statement and their assessment of the election results. But before we do that, I would like to invite our um, audience to ask questions. You have an opportunity to ask questions through a Q&A box that you see on Zoom in your app. Um, please write questions in that box and we will try to include as many of these questions into the conversation. Randall, would you like to say anything? Um, and, and just and welcome to everybody. And uh, thank you to Pavel for uh, actually organizing this uh, extensively. And I'm looking forward to a very good conversation. Oh. So without further ado, I will hand over to Jan. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I forgot. I have a, um, charts with election results, um, and I will post them. Just a second. So these are the results, the final results of the elections in Poland. As you can see, peace reached 35,38%. The um, civic coalition is second with 30,7%. The third way, which is a coalition between a peasants party and a new centrist party um, with 14,4%, uh, and the new left with 8,6761%, uh, and Confederacja which is an extreme nationalist um, uh, party with 7,16%. That turns into this, as you can see, um, division into mandates. Uh, peace with a winning party with 194 uh, seats, um, civic coalition with 157 seats, third way with 65 and uh, the, link, the, le the left with 26 and Confederacja with 18. Um, yes, that's uh, just to give you an overview of the election results. Jan, I'm sorry, um, I'm, I'm handing over to you. Okay, uh, thank you uh, for uh, the invitation. I'm delighted to be with you and such a great company. And I, I suppose I will um, just share my preliminary um, impressions and emotions. I am extremely, I'm a bit tired because I keep watching this stuff. I cannot stop watching it during the night, but I am absolutely um, ecstatic, I think, even if you don't see that too much, because this is a result that is um, truly amazing um, in in and uh, several ways um, I, I guess very quickly what, what strikes me most uh, first is the size of victory which was maybe not predicted and was very hard to predict but nobody I think talked about that size of victory particularly in in the Senate. That this is a knockout. Uh, you know, there was a moment, um, I don't know, two days ago, when people thought maybe uh, the uh, democ so called democratic opposition will gain some seats. They had 51, 
now it's 65 so this is this is pretty powerful uh, signal that uh, the a substantial portion of the society was uh, not very happy with to put it mildly with the eight years of the of the governing uh, coalition led by peace. Uh, second, perhaps most important in a way, is, is the turnout. This is the biggest turnout in the uh, since the fall of communists, including the elections that brought down communists, which are only, as people may remember, partially uh, free and partially contested. Uh, so this is huge. A uh, third takeaway for me is enormous mobilization of young people. Uh, the people uh, who uh, are classified as young, so I think it's 18 to 29, right? They, this is almost 25%, between 20 to 25% increase in their participation. And the complaint for, complaint for years was that they were systematically outperformed by other age groups, uh, particularly those above 60, and now they actually outperformed everybody. And it is also visible in the candidates. So there's a kind of, uh, here and there at least, generational change, as much as one can see, uh, particularly young women coming to positions, uh, uh, gaining positions in this, in the lower house of parliament, I, I don't think too many women among the new senators, as much as I could see. But it is it is a huge, huge change, and in some cases, established older male politicians, who I think hope to be rather easily elected on their respective parties lists, lost, were outperformed by by younger people, particularly younger females. Um, and the fourth, I think, the fifth point uh, is the vote abroad uh, that was massive. Again, the vote, the turnout went up considerably. And I'm looking here at the numbers I received recently. Uh, this is this is a pretty important change. Uh, uh, the margins of difference are huge. Uh, civic. Uh, Coalition forty five percent, whereas the ruling uh, uh, Law and Justice Party sixteen percent, the left fourteen point five, the third way twelve point two, Confederation eight point nine, um, so that that is quite a a change. Um, again, it seems that this is driven by the young younger. Uh, voters who decided to to participate in those elections, which were often described as uh, the most important elections um, since the fall of communism in 89, um, mostly because everybody worried that in the, another four years uh, in government by this coalition would push Poland further down um, on this uh, scale of, of democratic backs backsliding. And uh, it is important to remember that Poland has been sliding according to all major um, agencies that try to rank those things. Poland uh, was sliding since 2015, um, clearly when the governing uh, coalition came uh, power to power. Now, I, I suppose we will have time to talk about all kinds of issues that now um, uh, the polls are faced with. It's a it's a new situation, but it is still a potentially a dangerous situation because the as quite a few observers point out, uh, Kaczynski is not the one. Who there is a suspicion that he may try to delay the transfer of power. There are several possibilities, more or less within the rules. You can drag your feet on several procedural issues, and that can take a few months, up to a few months, um, during which time they can still um, 
uh, well, maybe try to figure out something new, for example, I don't know, some kind of emergency uh, or um, uh, uh, perhaps this is a very cynical view. It will at least give them a few more months to steal even more because there are a lot of people who are pretty uh, upset, uh, a lot of observers by the uh, the emergence, not to the same degree as in, say, um, Hungary of, of a specific, somewhat different from the Hungarian model, nonetheless, the mafia state or, or something in which the people uh, who are associated with power are placed in the positions in the various economic organizations and benefit from it in, in various ways and in turn uh, played a huge role uh, at the edge of legality and sometimes beyond it in during the electoral campaign. So I guess those are the main things I wanted to share initially. Thank you, Jan. Um, and I'm handing over directly to Monika. Um, thanks so much. Again, it's a true pleasure to, to be here today. Um, I, I should say to, you know, to, to uh, people who uh, don't have Polish citizenship and are listening in, that it, it was a it's a very peculiar experience to participate in uh, elections in the United States, because in contrast to polls uh, voting in Poland, uh, we have to vote on Saturday, uh, whereas everybody else votes on Sunday. So um, so when I was actually driving to the uh, polling station, I was pretty depressed about, you know, what kind of, um, you know, webinar we will be having today. And uh, the the polling, I'm, I live in Chicago, which is one of the most conservative diasporas in the, the in the world, probably, of Poles living abroad. And I am utterly convinced that I was uh, among the very few people who refused uh, the referendum ballot. So um, again, with Polish elections, nothing is simple. Everything re re requires an explainer. So the first explainer, is that this was not just an election. This was also um, uh, an opportunity to cast a referendum ballot, which was uh, the, the last supposedly ace pulled out of the sleeve of peace uh, in the months before the election, when in order to try to mobilize the electorate, they came up with four extremely populist questions uh, that really should not be admitted to any referendum. Uh, but there was a third ballot that uh, voters were asked uh, to, to fill out with questions concerning uh, equality of retirement age, uh, acceptance of uh, immigrants from uh, other continents than Europe, um, really a, a just a, a, a horrible questions uh, to, to ask in the context of, of an election. And the trick was that in order for this referendum to not be valid, um, the, uh, the quorum had to not be met. So fewer than 50% of voters, of, of eligible voters, had to participate in the in the referendum. So, so one had to uh, drive to the precinct, refuse the referendum ballot, vote in the remaining elections, but had to be very proactive about that. And the precinct that I was voting in, uh, it was all but assumed that I will be taking that referendum ballot. So at least on three occasions, I was uh, singled out <laughs> to other people standing in line that I did not take the referendum ballot, which was somewhat intimidating. And I remember driving home feeling Okay, this is what what living in Poland might be might be like in the future. But then, you know, two days later, uh, or one day later, really, uh, a very different result emerged. So uh, again, so what what exactly happened? Like, how did the opposition win, even though the party that is uh, leading um, the number of seats in the legislature won? Is, uh, is the incumbent piece. So um, th this is complicated more by the fact that Poland does have a directly elected president. So a lot of people think that it's a, a system that actually is more presidential than parliamentary, but it in fact is a parliamentary system. And in order to form a cabinet, one has to gain approval of the majority of the legislature. And peace even having won this election, even with in a coalition with a party it doesn't really love, but that is ideologically closest to it, Confederacja is still falling short of that uh, parliamentary majority. So even though the president, according to the constitution, has to give the right to form the first cabinet to a member of the peace party, and even though that party will now have um, uh, a month, so the, first the president will have two weeks to, uh, to, to ask this uh, peace member to form a cabinet, 
then that party will have a month for negotiations. After that month, there will be a vote in the legislature, which will fail because there's no, there's almost no way that uh, peace could convince um, members of these other anti-peace parties to join. And I'll explain why that is the case in, in a moment. Uh, that will already be a delay of a month and a half from the get-go. Only after that will the president go to the second largest party, which is, in this case, Koalicja uh, Obywatelska, ask them to form a cabinet. And uh, hopefully uh, those negotiations will proceed swiftly. There will be a vote. But we're looking basically at about three months until the opposition actually takes over power. So, uh, so why are we so confident that this takeover will actually happen? Okay, so two things. The first is that uh, in so many words, uh, Kaczynski actually conceded that he lost. On the night of the elections, he said that it's 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 very likely that peace will not be able to form a cabinet. That's a, a, that's a very good sign. Political scientists, uh, when they want to use sort of shortcuts in determining whether a country is a democracy or not a democracy, they use this um, so-called minimalist uh, definition of democracy, which is uh, which was po coined by Adam Przeworski. Uh, democracy is a system where losers uh, where losers uh, step down from power, so they concede elections. So exactly the opposite of what happened in the U.S. with with Trump. Uh, so so to me, when I heard that comment from Kaczynski, he was of course furious. He was you know uh, clearly um, not having the the evening of his life. But but I was very pleased to actually hear that. But but it is there, there is going to be uh, some delay. Um, but we're we're pretty confident that nothing will come out of those peace efforts because any of the, the parties that they would have to uh, try to convince to join their coalition already knows that they will be in a cabinet coalition if they just wait another month and a half. Um, so, um, so, so, so what's in it for them? Well, the only thing that I guess could be in for particular members is maybe, you know, you could, you could try to break up those parties by promising them ministerial portfolios or promising them uh, positions. But but accepting any of these so-called bribes would be very short-term thinking on part of politicians, right? Because Poland is not a nascent democracy anymore, right? It's a it's a country that has had robust political parties for th over three decades now, and it's pretty apparent to those members of those political parties that were they to accept this kind of bribe from a party that they have programmatically criticized for the entirety of their electoral campaign and basically just agree to join their coalition for the sake of having more, more posts uh, than waiting another month and a half, that would essentially be political death for them. And not to mention the fact that they would, following this term, have to then create in, an entirely new party. So I think that's a very risky maneuver for a professional uh, career politician. And that's why I'm, I'm pretty optimistic. But you know, just as the process of backsliding uh, that started in 2015 and has hopefully concluded now was very gradual. So will the process of building the democracy back up. So I think there has to be sort of a lot of patience on the on the side of uh, of, of of people who are outside of uh, government, outside of the civil service, and uh, in in just accepting that the, this this constitutional process has to play out. It will play out uh, in the opposition's favor. And you know, there's um, there, there's nothing to be done beyond that. The second thing I will say is I think it's very important that the incoming liberal coalition um, exercise restraint. So there is already a lot of talk right now about how oh the president is going to delay the cabinet formation to give uh, members of peace time to cover up their traces and try to like hide all the corruption they've engaged in and destroy documents, et cetera, et cetera. And I, what I'm sensing here as somebody who's worked uh, for two decades now in transitional justice, so how new democracies deal with former authoritarian regimes. So what I'm hearing here is this, uh, this call for uh, somehow holding these uh, previous uh, ruling elites accountable. And um, of course, if there's evidence of corruption, like that should be followed through. But but I would uh, I would caution um, those who will be uh, entering government from the side of the liberal coalition uh, to exercise restraint uh, in, to, to some to some degree, because uh, I think it's very critical that for in these first two years that uh, are going to be, when I say two years, I mean the two years between um, uh, the, the parliamentary elections 
and the presidential and, and the, 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 the electoral campaign for the next presidential elections, I think it's going to be very critical for uh, the liberal coalition to deliver during this time, because uh, I think that the only way that uh, former peace voters who turned up to vote for the liberal coalition, as well as new voters who voted for the liberal coalition third way and Nova Levitsa for the first time, the only way they are going to keep voting is if they see some actual change happening. And I think that uh, concentrating on accountability and prosecuting every single person who participated in the peace government uh, could be a huge distraction here. Um, and moreover, as much as this might seem like regime change, it is not regime change, precisely because of this reaction of Kaczynski, who pretty much conceded elections. Uh, this is not the same scale of change as we observed in 1989. So, uh, so, so I would, um, I will, I will uh, end perhaps here by saying that there's this. Okay, I'm, I'm going to just like risk it and say it. there's this slogan um, that. Uh, was circulated among political elites at the time when uh, the conservative coalition uh, was taking over in 2005, uh, TKM, which means Teraz uh, Kurbamy, which means now it's our turn. And it's a slogan that political elites would use amongst themselves to, uh, to describe the purging of bureaucracies, of ministries, of departments, of everybody who had the slightest association with the previous team. And although it seems like a very natural thing to do, because like, why would you want to have holdovers from the previous administration? It's a very risky move because uh, uh, one has to staff those positions with new bureaucrats, new uh, civil servants, new people who simply might not know uh, what they're doing. Um, so uh, restraint actually might be more prudent in, in this situation and uh, will most certainly be, be more effective. I'll end there and, um, and give uh, uh, Michal uh, a chance to give his remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. Michal, would you like to share your uh, assessments? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Uh, OK, so uh, thank you for your invitation. It's a great, great pleasure and honor to, to be here. And I will try to, to, to share with you my thoughts about elections. And I will also somehow connect my, my speech with my current research, so my strains of my research. So as um, as, as Paweł introduced me, uh, so I for some time I'm I'm national coordinator for European Social Survey in Poland. And I will I will relate to, to the results of the last wave of European Social Survey some, somehow. Um, so the so a few a few words about the study. So the study is conducted since two thousand two, and we have already we have ten rounds, and so and each round was conducted each two years. So actually we can we can trace some trace some trends in the in in Polish society how opinions attitudes change over time. And actually, what we observed in the last wave conducted in twenty twenty. So we observe. I'm sorry, my kid entered the room. <laughs> to make project. So I'm um, sorry. Uh, so what we observed in the last uh, in the last in the last round in comparison to others. So we observed that Polish society became more and more open, more and more progressive in terms of cultural terms. So uh, so that uh, in terms of, for example, LGBT communities, we Poles are not ashamed of having LGBT com LGBT person in the family, and this rate of being ashamed is going down th through years. We believe that LGBT people should uh, arrange their life according to their own beliefs, and this is this. So the so we observe that the constant constant progressive way increase of progressive way of thinking across years across 2002 to 2022. Uh, also, like uh, in the last wave, it appeared that we are more open toward migrants. That that uh, surveyed people say that uh, people from other countries, also from other continents, should uh, should be allowed to to live and stay in Poland. It also appeared in the last wave of ESS that uh, Poles are also more concerned about climate change and also agree that uh, that it's about human that climate change is a result of human activity and also that uh, in such issues as raising children that the most important is to 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 to, to look at um, child's own opinion that obedience. So all in all, that on various issues that it appeared that Poland became more and more open, more more and more uh, progressive, culturally progressive. So when I presented this 
results for the first time i so i the reaction was the re direction i got was that something like something is wrong with your data so how come that we have that you said that we have quite progressive society and we have such conservative government but actually <laughs> now we have correction now it appeared that uh, that the view of the that it was kind of disconnection between between the view of the between the view of the of the society on various issues and and the, and the people who are the political class who was in power and actually the the most in these cultural issues the most differences which we observed was not was, was it was not between people living in countryside and in metropolis it was not among people with various levels of, of education it was between age groups it appeared that that the most conservatives are people who are older and the most progressive are those who are younger and these younger people they were motivated to, to took part in this election something something what Jan already said so um so here I would say that from the perspective so I don't want to say that I predicted this result this is I was not I was not sure about what happened but but from the view of the study now 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 it seems logical that 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 something changed in Polish society and become we we become more let's say modernized or I don't know how to call it in a different way but but uh, but in like in various aspects of in various ways in various kinds of attitudes Polish young people are very much as they they colleagues in uh, their friends in Western European countries. Um, um, okay, so this is the first thing which I wanted to say. Another issue is that also somehow connected to to to, to the research I I conducted. So I did some study about electoral change in Poland, and and for this study I use another data set, which is also the great one. I mean, uh, Polish uh, panel survey Polpan. So this is the study, which is is the panel. So the same people are 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 surveyed each five years, and the panel study is great because it started 1988 be before transition, and uh, and each five years. All the respondents, but also new respondents, are 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 um, sampled and 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 surveyed. And here in this study, I look about. I, I studied electoral change, and one of the so until 2000, um, 2018 was the last wave. So the the result which I got from the previous years was the following. So that actually uh, we did not ex we did not um, experience notice in Poland a lot of swing votes so that situation that people that people that someone voted for one party and then changed camp to another party so actually what we observed was the rather demobilization of incumbent incumbent voters and mobilization of, op of opposition voters uh, so even in uh, in very lively 90s uh, people became according to Paul data people be behave in in this in this way in this way and actually so so previously we observed these two mechanisms that that uh, losers of elections will usually lose because of the mobilization uh, and what happened this year in this election so actually this mechanism about the mobilization of incumbent voters actually it did not uh, happen because like we have like in in uh, let's look just number of voters uh, in two, uh, two years ago 2019 we have 8 million of people voted for law and justice peace this year we have 7.6 million and from exit poll study we know that from among people who voted for law and justice in previous elections more than 90 percent voted for the same party so they lost only in terms of real number only half a million and uh, it's also possible that they lost it because of demographic reasons, because these are older people who already died. In the meantime, they died in the in the in this in this in this in this period. Uh, what about but the the other thing which I have from my previous study is that the winning party usually the winning camp usually won because of mobilization of new voters. And let's look at numbers. So previously. For the opposition parties in, in two years ago, we have 8.9 million voters for the three parties who uh, which won elections. 8.9. Right now it's 11.6, almost three millions more. So actually, what happened here is that we did not observe so much the mobilization of peace voters, but we observe huge mobilization, also young people, also women. Uh, uh, who mobilized to, to vote for, for opposition party, parties uh, in these elections. And now I go to, to, the, to, I think, the last point, which I wanted to say that we still should remember that um, uh, 
that actually law and justice peace is the party which was the first in these elections and still we have 8 million peace voters who live together with us, who live in the same country as opposition voters. So still they, it's, they have still huge support. It's not like the complete, uh, so this result is not like, like uh, so the, this, this, um, uh, this difference in seats is not huge. By the way, you see you see how disproportional is, is electoral system in Poland. <laughs> Actually, opposition has like more than three millions more, uh, about three millions more votes than, uh, no, actually four millions votes more than 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 peace. And uh, but this, it's not uh, it's not reflected in number of seats. Anyway, what I want to say that we still need to live together with with peace uh, peace voters. And also also another another result from the. European Social Survey in the last wave, we asked people about how they evaluate democracy and how they understand democracy. What are the views, normative views about democracy? And what is interesting about voters of law and justice is that they were very much satisfied how the, with the way how democracy works in Poland. Uh, which was like kind of surprising that recording many, many, many like um, uh, measures um, democracy in Poland is declining, and these people are saying that this is that, that it's great. And also, and the, the answer is why they think like the, like this is that is is uh, the way how they understand democracy. So for uh, voters of liberal parties, democracy is are just procedures, uh, free elections, free media, and uh, also free and also independent and fair fair justice system. However, for law and justice voters, this liberal package is included, but to, but, a, but a, a part of it, they also think that uh, democracy is also reducing poverty and also fighting inequalities. So, well, we can say by definition, it's not democracy, but this is what they, these people have in mind. And they expect from democracy, not only like a procedures, but also some outcomes, social outcomes. And, and also the thing is that uh, voters of law and justice are people from lower level of, of social strata. I think I will finish at this moment, or maybe I can I can just for the end. Monica said that it there were very like uh, populistic uh, questions in the referendum, so I I can quote one question. So question why one do you support selling of state assets to foreign entities, leading to the loss of Poles' control over strategic sectors of the economy? So uh, try to answer yes for this question. Okay, thank you. Yeah, um, that's um, a rich uh, set of reflections on, on um, what was going on. And it strikes me there's, there's so many directions that we could take that. I'm wondering though, Monica, Jan, if you might um, then, um, Michal gave us uh, interesting statistics that, that, that correspond to what you've been saying. I, I, wonder if you could or all three of you could say something about what actually were the things that led to that kind of mobilization in the election process what were the moments uh that that brought people out and i'm wondering in particular um these kinds of coalitions uh that that succeeded in poland uh were tried in turkey and failed uh were very unstable in israel uh, and and lasted for a very, very short time. Uh, there have been other places where these kinds of attempts have been made uh, in order in Hungary itself. There was there was a similar sort of attempt. And I'm wondering why the coalition, from your perspective, actually was able to to accomplish the kind of turnout um, that 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 it did. And if there's if there were moments uh, like various scandals uh, around visas, for instance, that 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 led uh, to to kind of transformation, or if it was if it was a different deployment of media, for instance, because we know that the the control of state media was was something that that was um, spoken about quite a bit. So what 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 were the moments for you that that you said yes these these are the places where there was success? Because just just to add on to it, I think what we see here it could uh, wind up becoming a model for other sorts of practices outside of Poland. Um, so do do any of the three of you have thoughts on that? Jan, um, you're you're eager to, <laughs> to say something and then and then we'll see maybe Monica has 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 something to contribute there. Um, be, be, before I, I will 
share with you my thoughts on this. Uh, if I can add to uh, Michal's uh, uh, numbers, the number of people who voted, absolute number, who voted for a civic coalition went up by 1 million point six. So you gave the number how much it went down for the uh, law and justice. Uh, that, that's pretty remarkable, uh, I think. But then if you look at the people who uh, in 2019 declared that they didn't vote, 30%, I'm just looking at these numbers, 30% of their vote went to civic coalition, right? So this, and, and one thing we haven't mentioned yet is that Donald Tusk, the leader of civic coalition is by far the, the most successful person in these elections, almost half a million votes. The Kaczynski, who is I think second is 100,000 something. Uh, so Tusk is the most successful politician ever since 89 in terms of votes he got as a single person. So yes, so it even enhances that that um, your, your, your question, Randall, and that the, so I have quickly three points. Uh, for different audience, different groups of people, there is perhaps a different set of uh, reasons. For politicians, by and large, people who are more kind of professionally also around politics like us, I think it was simply the destruction of democracy. So this was the fear that Poland is uh, sliding into autocracy. So this is, of course, something that demands a certain level of interest and maybe a, a, a bit of more uh, kind of professional or semi-professional knowledge about how politics works. So this is this 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 fear of the fate of, of procedural democracy, as, as Miha was describing it. On the other, then I would add two other groups. Young people, I think young people uh, were driven by the sense that they are living in the country that is too conservative, by and large, too traditionalistic. It's kind of moving, that the, the ruling party is pushing it back. The role of the church, huge. So you have those famous results from the uh, Pew uh, research showing that there is a decline of religiosity around in the world. The biggest decline over the last few years is among the Polish youth for all, of all the countries. In this incredibly Catholic country, you have the dramatic change in, in when you look at the uh, age cohorts in terms of religiosity. And finally, women, their, their role is, is, is huge. Uh, Poland ended up with the most restrictive uh, uh, law regulating women's right to choose or their women's reproductive rights. And there were huge demonstrations. You know, I am the, someone who studies protest and you always ask yourself a question, you know, so what comes out of the protest? I mean, it, often you don't see much right after the process ended, a protest ended, but now people, I think rightly are beginning to point out those were the moments where people learned together in large numbers that there are certain issues that they need to fight for. And then wisely, one would say that they man they said to themselves, okay, we need to go and vote. The streets is not enough. It just needs to be also the ballot box. And well, it was successful. Yeah, so I, sorry, I will. I, I, Monica, sorry, yeah, I had to unmute myself. Stumbling around there, please. I'm gonna I'm gonna build on what uh, Jan said about protests. I think that you know the the protests from just a few weeks ago, the March of a Million Hearts, that was um, organized by members of the opposition. I think that was a very important signal to um, citizens amongst each other how strong actually their actions were because it was uh, it was aimed to attract million protesters. It exceeded those expectations. And I think it showed um, that the anti-peace opposition was actually, you know, part of the same uh, opposition. So it was it was undivided in that sense. And um, and the the role of Tusk here really cannot be understated. I think I I remember when I was went to Poland. I think a couple of years ago when he finished his term in the European Union, and returned to take over the leadership of Platforma. 
And I don't know if you remember, there were critical voices accompanying that, right? There was uh, there was this feature published in uh, Gazeta Wyborcza by Jacek Zrakowski titled um, The Father's Return, where he really criticized Tusk so much for basically destroying the perspectives of the new emerging leaders of 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 the plat of uh, the civic platform, of making you know their their um, of not rewarding their efforts, um, but just replacing them. But it was the right thing to do because I think he was the only credible person to actually unite the opposition. And moreover, Poland is not a two party system and there is room for other parties. And I think that the emergence of, or maybe not the emergence, but the strengthening of Trzecia Droga and of Nova Lewica during that period, just like showed, yeah, there is room for, for everybody, but there was definitely a need for somebody with his quality of leadership skills. Um, and on, on Michał's comments about the polarization of political elites contrasting with the more liberal attitudes of uh, the Polish public, that's actually not that unusual. So the United States actually exhibits a very similar pattern where parties are much more polarized than the than the public is. And you know, political scientists, I think, are way beyond the Downsian model of politics that predicted that, you know, parties should converge to the center because that's where the median voter is. And we now actually have models explaining how that is possible. And, uh, you know, and I, and I think here, you know, like the Polish example is, is just one of many. But I will say just like a note of caution, whether, you know, to what extent can the Polish experience be extrapolated? I think that I think that a huge role beyond, you know, Tusk's leadership in the mobilization of the liberal electorate actually um, w w is something, um, you know, that goes back to Poland's pro-democratic traditions. So, um, so you know, back to 1989, and Poland, just like historically, has traditions of resistance towards uh, authoritarianism. And I think that the areas that we saw more um, anti-peace mobilization are also the, the areas where, you know, we've seen, you know, we, we saw decades ago mobilization against... Um, communism authoritarianism so there is there was a culture of resistance to um undemocratic or unfair unequitable rule that you know like dates back uh, decades if not centuries and you know maybe that's not an experience that can be replicated everywhere um so um so i know this is this is not this is a somewhat out of character claim for me to make because i do identify as an institutionalist uh, and this is maybe something that more cultural anthropologists would say, but you know, as a poll, I, I believe that that's yeah. I'm getting thumbs up from Jan, so I'm in trouble. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I don't. I don't think you're in trouble, and I think actually Pavel might uh, also agree. I think we have some interesting um, questions um, uh, from our audience, and one of them, Patrice Tabrowski, asked something that's partially related here in terms of what might have motivated um, uh, the shift. And the question was about Ukraine and the the, the shift in the position on Ukraine uh, that peace uh, led. And if that um, might have also had some kind of factor in in the election, do either do any of you have any thoughts on that? If that 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 was something that was uh, influential here, so Michel, maybe, maybe? about mm -hmm. about Ukraine. So I don't think it will be change in 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 uh, uh, Polish like a perspective. So the Polish government position towards war. So still, I think it will be so. So uh, actually, it was used by by Law and Justice Party for the for Tusk that they that they are more that um, if they come to power, they probably they will be pro-Russian. So it was used as as an as uh, as an argument to uh, so um, as adjective towards them. However, I don't expect any change in the in in the position um, towards Ukraine towards help to Ukraine. Even I think. Polish-Ukrainian relationship should improve because recently they were in a bit um, bad shape because there we have this crisis with grain, and uh, and I, actually what I expect is like also like to have like a broader in broader view to to improvement of relationship with other neighbors like Germany like like Czech Republic because also we have tensions on the border because environmental issues with Czechs, and also the. Um, uh, and for for law and justice government, Germany was treated as uh, as same enemy almost as Russia. So uh, it was amazing that Germany is the is the main is the most 
important like a part, business partner for Poland and Germany was treated as one of one of the enemies. And now I now now there is a hope that some kind of cooperation, Polish German cooperation, will improve. And also this Weimar Triangle, Polish, France, and Germany cooperation will also be better. And I and I think um, Putin is not happy about this result of the election. And um, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, very quickly, if I may add something to that, uh, when Michal uh, mentioned uh, grain, um, I, I, I just remember that one group that voted whatever, close to 90% for peace were the, the farmers. Uh, that's one. So this is, uh, I think that in this sense, peace convinced them during this grain crisis, that it, it 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 is the best protector of their interests, right? But that's that's about the that's about it. I mean, I I know that I, I haven't looked at those numbers recently, but the number of people, the level of support, the intensity of support for Ukraine, somewhat right? Me, how you perhaps know better, is kind of going down a little bit, but not much. Or, or Monica, maybe you remember, but it's going a bit down, but it is not yes. a major factor. But mm -hmm. this one thing, this one professional group, uh, uh, Peace made a huge effort and they were uh, upfront about it, that they wanted to win the, the, the countryside. And, and they did, <laughs> but it's not enough. I mean, Monica, I think- did you want to add yeah, just that, you know, the, the, the danger perhaps there is that, you know, that that group does seem to be concentrated in, in certain regions of Poland. So, um, you know, my hometown is, well, I grew up in Warsaw, but my hometown is Novosąd. That's where my family is from. And it it is just a peace stronghold and has been for so many years. And, you know, a lot of the things that I'm saying about these cultural legacies of anti-authoritarian resistance actually come from being in Novosant, where there was very little resistance also under communist times, and it's a very heavily rural area, where, um, you know, I, I think that there are the, the, you know, maybe it's a legacy of the Austro, of the Habsburg Empire, but there's this just tendency to first and foremost, like, make sure that your economic well-being is secured for the next two years in case, you know, there's a flood or in case there's a famine or that the, the basically the priorities that people have are you know farmers needs land um you know economic security and you know and politics you know like that's something for leisure time um so and the and i and i think it is somewhat of a concern that you know that there there will be a disgruntled um electorate that might feel unrepresented by this new coalition because even though as somebody pointed out in the q a even though this uh, the anti peace coalition is very broad, it stretches from left to right uh, or left to center, but it does not include those disgruntled voters in you know the Novosantras of of Poland. I think it's a, it's an interesting question, um, you know, in terms of the future of the of the coalition. I think Michal, you said that uh, you know it was mostly young people and non conservative. Uh, world views, whereas I think already now the Trecha Droga is saying that they won't, won't touch it, and they they rather say, okay, let's remain the re retain the status quo in in these cultural and ethical issues. So I wonder if you can say something about this and the future of the cohesion, and what is what are the first things that they can and they will put on the agenda. In, in the new government, if they will form the government. Anyone has a, would like to start? It's difficult. Yeah, uh, please. Hmm. Yes, actually, well, I don't know, uh, because uh, so they, uh, for sure there is agreement about these um, democratic rules which should be so that the, the way of functioning of the of the country between the between the coalition it's a it's agreement uh, about um, if, like end up with with nepotism on in state owned companies and also to providing more procedures and also to 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 like improve relationship with eu and improve 
um, um, like also the like, like like providing like more decentralization, more funds towards more funds towards local governments and also in financing and also in kind of free form of education. Uh, so like financing the education, they see the problem with, with public education. And there are many areas in which they they have more or less the, the area of the area of cooperation. And I think Michal froze. Michal froze, yeah, also on my end. Yeah. Let's hope he will come back. Anyone would like to pick up where he did? I, yeah. I mean, I don't know that I'll pick up oh, where he, Monica, go ahead. Yeah, where he left, but... Oh, there he is. Oh, sorry. Sorry. He you were so... frozen for a little while. Okay. Okay. Uh, so I think my kids used to do something with internet. I need to react. But then, but anyway, uh, so I think that still, um, well, I, I don't know what, at what moment I was cut, but uh, I think still there are many. There are many areas which we in which they have common common view, and uh, and I hope that they will manage somehow with this. Also, there is issue of positions. It's still not clear who would be prime minister, who would be speaker of the lower and uh, upper chamber of the parliament, and uh, we we hear various issues from media. But uh, well, I would say. <laughs> Keep it, keep it, uh, keep relax on it, and then let's make them let let let's let let's let let's make them um, uh, room to talk and and see let's see what happens. Monica, yeah, yeah. So so I'm really glad that um, that Michal mentioned positions. I was hoping he would, uh, because so so Poland is actually a country that has you know over the last few decades observed quite a bit of majoritarian shift. So even though you know the electoral system is proportional. But, uh, you know, there are certain functions uh, in governing institutions that are extremely important. I mean, the Speaker of the House is one of them, basically, like sort of determining, you know, what gets put on the agenda. Now, for the for the unity of the, the, the Democratic Coalition, I'm actually very optimistic because they have such a long list of things to do to place on the agenda that they agree on, that I think it will give them enough work for the two years you know, until they manage to get to the presidential elections where they don't have to do with a, deal with a veto. Um, on that, however, so Poland does have a directly elected president who has very few powers, but one of those powers is the power of veto. And the, the Democratic coalition is uh, still short on enough votes to overturn that veto. Um, so so actually legislating for, for, the, for, for those first two years uh, might proceed a little bit slowly on account of that. Although, you know, it's yet to see what's going to happen with peace. So they have a very large party uh, after these elections, but uh, but the unity of parties in the opposition tends to crumble, right? Because there's not much keeping together parties in the opposition other than the sheer hope that they will eventually be back in government. So um, I am optimistic that they will be able to, you know, to peel off some of those uh, peace members to overturn the presidential veto, which I'm sure is going to be used and abused uh, a bunch uh, by Duda. Uh, but, I, but, but, I, but I think that they have enough things for now to agree on. I also think that in this new coalition, uh, the third way, Trzecia Droga, is going to be uh, extremely important simply because it's pivotal, right? So uh, it will always, and it's, you know, it's a parliamentary system. So a cabinet can fall any time and an alternative cabinet can form. And, you know, any of those parties that are making up a coalition with Pio and Levica and Trzecia Droga can uh, defect and form a, a coalition with, with peace. So there's that threat that they can always uh, use. Uh, but it always privileges like the party that's in the center of the coalition. So that's uh, that, that's my... Um. So, yeah, well, then, um, yeah. If I I don't know how maybe you have something directly related. So uh, no. Uh, uh, yeah, but let's go, go, go on, go on. Well, I'm usually an optimist, but somehow I will share with you some pessimistic thoughts. Um, you know, the, 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 I'll start from something that I've been recently working on: uh, uh, illiberalism, um, uh, as, as Randall mentioned. Uh, you know, the, the legacy of the Enlightenment and things like that. And I realized that this is a difficult stuff. You know, you, you have to have, uh, you have to teach people. This is not something that is um, sort of obvious. It is something that demands 
some civic education, for example, which is awful, uh, neglected sort of, in, in, it seems not, not, I mean, almost everywhere it seems where you look, but certainly in this country also, right? But so what's going to happen is that they have to work, they, what unites them are those procedural issues, the whole bunch of them, we could talk about it for hours. This is something that doesn't resonate very well with many people. This is the stuff that many people do not care much. People care about, uh, as Miha already mentioned, you know, results, outcomes, right? Not inputs, but outputs of the system. And the, that's going to be tough because there is an economic crisis most likely coming, or at least some downturn in the economy. Uh, because the, several reasons, but one of them is that now, the, you know, they were hiding their budget. Many economists I, I talked to uh, were, just didn't have good numbers because they were do, doing all kinds of tricks with the bookkeeping and some larger sums of money were kind of not in the official, let's call it, picture. Um, so that's going to be a problem, right? The, the the hopeful thing is that Brussels will release those funds, although the legal procedure is not clear, but maybe it will be some kind of award for Tusk. I don't know. It, it's hard to imagine procedurally how can this happen hard, uh, fast. But yeah, that, that will be something. But the economic crisis will mean that some of the benefits that people have perhaps will have to be somehow curtailed, at least they're, they're not going to be growing at the same rate, and, and so on. So that's an issue, and economic, and, you know, as always, the something economic, something cultural. Culturally, unfortunately, within the last 24 hours, one of the leaders of the third way already said that certain issues like the abortion law are not going to be this uh, on the common agenda, but this is something that, uh, as he put it, needs to be pushed aside from the common platform of the emerging three-party coalition. So he doesn't want to touch that issue because his electorate is more conservative, right? Whereas young women who are so instrumental on all of this, most of them by far hope that this will quickly change. So, yeah. But, but from an institution's um, perspective, Jan, like why would you care about the electorate four years before the election? <laughs> well, um, I mean, I can see why you would say that, but at the end of the day, at the end of the day, I think, you know, they'll go along. Yes. That, that's, a, that's a good point. I like that point. But maybe because you'd like to prepare the ground for winning the presidential election, which is not in four years, but sooner. I don't know. Do you have a but, chance for the president? You know, the, the, the point is that this is what Tusk and the, the more liberal cosmopolitan side was accused all the time, that they were technocratic and they didn't pay attention enough to what was happening in the society. So uh, Kaczynski will immediately start this uh, rhetoric. Right and can I, can I ask them, uh, me, uh, Michal? Well, I, I'm I'm interested uh, in 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 many ways. There's um, yeah the the invocation of the EU and the the opening up of funds. Uh, there's a huge celebration that this is a turn towards Europe uh, and, um, um, and and excitement about it. But but I'm wondering actually if we could just um speak a moment about tusk's actual politics and how indeed european they are and and it seems to me that there are certain areas um around perhaps one migration uh uh that that, that really are perhaps um uh out uh that that continue the policies uh, that have been in place uh, for for a while now, and uh, that it might not be exactly the the sort of um, liberal turn towards the EU and towards Europe that 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 people are thinking about. And I'm wondering if you have any um, any thoughts on that. Um, what what I mean, we're 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 in a realm in which we're discussing an opposition to a very very conservative uh, agenda. 
and and by virtue of the the um uh, the rest of the, the the new coalition and the coalition partners look to be progressive but but is that actually true and is it um a, a coalition that's that's ready to line up and um and and work with Ursula von der Leyen and and indeed um sort of follow through on, on many of the other things uh, does that make sense um, I mean I feel um, that you know so so uh anything that Tusk does will, or, you know, any of the parties making up the coalition will be so much better than, you know, pieces stance together with just openly criticizing, I think every single institution of the EU that, you know, that's that's already going to be a, a welcome change. So, but, you know, would I expect, you know, a whole, you know, a completely progressive turn? No, probably not because, um, you know, there are parts of EU activity in Poland that are popular, but a lot that are not popular. Um, so, you know, since he's so much better than the alternative, you know, why, you know, why play with fire? And Poland is an important member of the EU. And Tusk himself is no longer looking for a career in the EU institutions because he, he's already, you know, had the best position there was to have. But it's still very po a positive outlook for the EU, as you know, the the reaction of the markets, I think, clearly shows. I mean, I think po po the Polish Zlata is stronger uh, today than it has been in a very long time. So, and I would say that what we what can we expect is at least that um, at the moment, uh, mm, I hope will it will become back of professional diplomats and professionals who knew how EU is functioning. And who know how to talk with people in EU because like Polish government recently was completely isolated and it was was not able to form any coalition. So um some 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 Polish point of view or regional point of view could be could be put to the agenda and with maybe in and and maybe Pol Poland became again kind of regional leader or one of the regional leaders because recently it was and actually the previous government or still the government was they were actually they were proud that, that they lost twenty seven to one various various votes because they said that this is the way how we defend our independence and um, still. Um, uh, still, I think that well, well, like the like the example, what what happened with the with the professionals in EU was was the case of uh, Ambassador Marek Prawda, who was ambassador uh, of Poland in at EU uh, uh, during the Tusk government, uh, and then when the when 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 the law and justice took the power, he organized the first visit of the of the new government, and then then he was fired by the by the law and justice government but eu um, re, so eu recognized that he is a very good diplomat so he the, the next day or very soon he became uh, ambassador of eu at in warsaw uh, so and we actually we they they, they lost many like a professional diplomats uh, so they fired them because they didn't didn't trust them and they, now, now i hope that they will become that, that they they will be uh, um again like in, in office and then with that that uh, various issues could be could be so the polish polish position will will be uh, uh, more important at eu level uh, about migration i don't know because so tusk also like about policy of tusk so indeed he used some anti immigrant um appeals during electoral campaign but on the other hand as I said, according so, uh, what is the mass opinion? So, according to European Social Survey, so most most of the people agrees about about um, allowing to allowing um, migrants to come to Poland. We will have in twenty twenty five like a huge module about uh, attitudes towards refugees and migrants. We will see like more deeply what's going on, but also like um, about cult so the one of the Jan's topics is cultural anthropo anthropology, culture and politics and. And uh, one of the one one of the event important event during electoral campaign was the was the film of Agnieszka Holland a Green Border. It was about the situation on the border, and many people like came there and finally realized that something that on the border horrible things uh, are going on still. And I saw so when I was in the cinema, I I saw people sitting next to me crying, and people saw not it was so. It was not an, when when I was there, but 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 in other parts of Poland, I heard that pe people were, were clapping their hands during after after the after the film. So, 
So still like this anti-immigrant, anti-refugees appeals so uh, are mm, are not so popular at the moment in Poland. They 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 could be uh, they could so people op opinions are very volatile on this issue. But at the moment, still people uh, that people Poles are an and voters of 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 uh, uh, civic platform and also voters of left party. Uh, they are like a pro pro migrants and somehow pro refugees. Mm. Jan, did you? Um, I I would only add, yeah, this is very important uh, that that film um, provoked um, um, sort of uh, dictated the t tone of the last days of the debate, and the official governmental uh, reaction was hysterical almost. I mean, it was really aggressive. Uh, which I think they went too far that, you know, people may say, well, you know, maybe I don't agree with everything in this film, but but Agnieszka Holland should not be attacked to that degree. Uh, people have respect for her. Many people, she, they know that she's accomplished, recognized worldwide uh, film director. Um, so they, I think, to my, my sense, they, they overplayed their hand a little bit. But, you know, I think most important thing is I, I do hope and I don't know why it wouldn't go forward like that, is that the president, the new government will immediately become much more humane and the crisis at the Belarusian, the border with Belarus will be somehow dealt with in a very different manner. I mean, I think that, that people expect that and I think that the, the, the ruling the, the new government will, will immediately know that uh, that they need to do that. Um, uh, but it was, this this reminds me, I mean, if you observe the migration policy in this country, and if you recall how Obama was criticized for not being more open, but still kind of talking about the border protection, Biden the same thing, right? No, nobody expected much, anything different from Trump, but the democratic presidents both before and after Trump, you know, that there was, it's, it's an incredibly difficult issue, right? It was, there were no easy solutions, no simple answers, obviously. And, but again, I, I do think that they will become much more serious about finding the way to provide for those people and take them out of this horrible situation. And uh, at the same time, standing up to Lukashenko, who, of course, is, is the main I mean, I, source of problems. I think my my question isn't just about the the sort of the, the welcoming of migrants in um, in Poland or not, but rather also about the coalition of the Visegrad states that that has has created a kind of um, block uh, and and has been um, something that that has not paid attention to what's happening, say in Italy, and and has really, um, and Frontex itself is located in Warsaw, its headquarters. Um, so there's, there, there there's both a kind of regional um, uh, alignment that had existed previously, which uh, I guess I I'm, uh, I would turn this into a question back to you that. That, that if if I'm asking a question about the EU in general and the relationship, what what do you think now for the status? And it seems already that Orban and Hungary have 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 started looking elsewhere, looking for other things, and Slovakia um, is also in 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 a different trajectory. What 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 might we expect uh, for the for this region, which had had been really aligned in in a way that blocked much of the Western European and Southern European agendas, might that now be something that that itself has transformed, and that that block is no longer going to be there? Um, do you have any thoughts on that? If I may, really very quickly, because as Miha was talking, I wrote down on a piece of paper, Fico, Orban, Pavel, and Tusk, and how I get this, there's no way to solve that puzzle. I mean, they, they, this is the still undoable business within the Visegrad uh, uh, system. They, they just cannot talk to each other in, in, about anything meaningful. 
uh, they are so different. The one thing that I was commenting some yesterday on, and someone asked me about uh, Fico and the results of the Slovak elections. And um, Fico is perceived as a very, very pro-Russian, pro-Putin, but I've been watching him for many years. He is a wishy-washy player. He is the, the, the classical uh, person who, uh, you know, in the IR terms, kind of looking for balance of power. So if he needs to, he goes west and he needs to, or calculates, he goes east. I don't think he is like Orban, who is now firmly uh, in in his own kind of position, which is clearly pro Putin in some sense, uh, but they cannot. I think it's dead. I mean, if I, it it cannot be revived. The Visegrad Four. I mean, it's a little concerning, right? Because you, I, you know, I've always been asking myself, like, what do the Visegrad countries really have in common? I mean, like, we no longer have a divide of Eastern and West Europe you know, as you said, the leaders are so different, but, you know, like one common problem you would think would be migration, right? Because it's, it's geographic. So, and geography is the one thing that they have in common. Um, so, yeah, so it's, I, I, I share your skepticism. Um, however, you know, I just remember that the way, if we cast our minds back to the way that PO lost power back in 2015, it was the Syrian refugee crisis, and Europe was making, you know, these demands on all member states to accept refugees. And Poland was, I think, supposed to, Eva Kopacz had committed Poland to accept 12,000. And that ended okay. up being 7,000. Yeah, that ended up being turned by peace into, oh my gosh, this is going to be, you know, inviting Hamas to Poland, like let's never accept this to happen. And in addition with the with the with the with the scandal with the sur with the surveillance scandal, like one could argue that that was what you know brought down PO's uh, you know eight years in, in government. So I, I could see why you know Tusk would be treading lightly on migration. But the question is how you know whether the loyalties to EU will um win out. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I believe at the time it was ISIS, but the, that's that's a small correction there. Um, but Michel, you wanted to uh, actually also um, like a few like a few words about migration crisis. So um, the thing also thing with the peace government was that they use more emotions and towards the electorate than than trying to solve the problem. And actually, when we so and I hope that the new government will more rely on experts about migration. And we have such experts in Poland, and they say that actually what's going on on Belarusian border is something which is not such um, critical situation. That there are that the, no, the procedures, the some scripts are known for the people who know who are experts in in immigration policies. That actually various actions, there are a set of actions which could be introduced. And for, first of all, we need to we need to, if people are on the border, we should. We should behave as humans and and provide help to them, but but also to 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 do several counter actions to including let's say some in information action at the at at countries from these people come come from to 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 explain the situation and that they are manipulated by Bogoshanka, for example. So. So and for like for experts in migration, this crisis actually is easily to solve. And and I hope that more that this government will use more experts in public in various areas of public policy than uh, and then emotions than than reflect to emotions for electorate like for so uh, how so one example how they use these emotions so for example we have this uh, on the border we have this big fence and when when these fence were built this was it was built by soldiers which which were fully equipped with the full gun so and then we have pictures of them so it looked like. These soldiers are building are, are building fans because some someone will attack them at the moment and they need to hold to have the the whole guns all the guns ready to shoot. It was not the case, but it was used just to to provide some image that we are in danger and these these people in power will provide some security for us will will save us. So um, so I I I hope for more rational way of thinking. Maybe I'm naive. But I, I expect more rational problem solving from current government than creating problems. Uh, oh, this is what I wanted to add. Can I ask um, 
So we've been talking about uh, the coalition. Um, there are questions in the Q&A, but in general, uh, what about peace? And I think, Jan, one of the things that strikes me as worth underscoring is that um, the liberal forces are also, are also learning. Uh, in the United States, um, one of the opinion polls uh, before Trump was elected was that amongst young evangelicals, um, anti-LGBTQ sentiments were almost uh, eviscerated, that, 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 that it was a sort of live and let live amongst the most conservative um, corners of the United States, and and really there was a sense, okay, um, this this is something that is no longer going to be an issue, and largely the shift in the United States to a question of trans rights has remobilized um, that kind of anti or that kind of othering that 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 has recoalesced um, uh, a sort of sexual gendered culture war under different terms, but that, that obviously has impact for women, for, um, for, for many other people in the United States. And so people learn. And, and so I'm wondering if you might have some way of thinking about what um, we might see peace doing. You've already mentioned that the first step is going to be drag out the process, uh, that, that we have two years of Duda and making sure that, that his veto is, is, is going to be deployed. Um, but but uh, just listening, Michal, to the idea of, of a less affective um, oriented um, politics, is is that a good thing? Um, and let's just say that 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 for a long time the electorate has been fired up precisely because of emotionality. Um, so is peace going to learn to say, okay, we're going to play it cool, or are they going to heat up um, the discourse coming up? I'm, I'm wondering if, 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 you, if you, looking into the crystal ball in, um, on that level, um, what, might me, what might you be expecting? Um, because, because it is a large portion of the electorate that's um, still uh, there uh, and needs to be um, uh, understood as, as, as part of the process here. Pavel, I'm sorry you were going to... Um, no, I just wanted to add to what you just said and to the question. I mean, the kind of is this a, the model that peace uh, created of sub subordinating all the means towards the national politics and retaining of power? Is that do we see a dismantling of that model or is it, you know, is it something uh, that will um, be with us for a longer time and then in which form? So I, I, I can I can try answering the, the question about, you know, like changing PEACE's program in response to preferences of voters. Uh, so, so PEACE did not become conservative uh, alone. Um, it has used as its broker the Catholic Church in Poland, which is a much stronger organi religious organization than I think any, any church in the United States. And uh, the, the Catholic Church, in, especially in Poland, is even more conservative than Catholic churches elsewhere. So I think it's going to be uh, very hard to, uh, to, to turn away from, from those programmatic commitments. Um, and I think, you know, peace has only itself to blame because, you know, this is, it's, it's, it's a, it's a two-way street, I think. Um, they know that if they, you know, if they, if they start liberalizing on social values, they will lose the support of those, you know, those brokers who are basically, you know, priests in churches telling people how to vote. Um, you know, perhaps an unknown fact again to the uh, non-Polish citizens in the audience, in Poland, uh, the elections are held on Sundays. So a very typical, uh, you know, thing to do is to go to Catholic mass and then go and vote. So, so here I think, you know, the, uh, the alliance with the Catholic Church will be a very hard one to break. Mm. It, uh, if I may, um, uh, this is still a roughly kind of a 50-50 country, like, like the United States. So I, I quickly looked at the numbers. So the 21.5 million people voted, valid votes, and 9.1 went to peace and confederacy. Now, not everybody in confederacia is socially extreme conservative. Some of them are economically extremely liberal, right, neoliberal. But 
still that that's that's roughly the the kind of uh, division of the country so there's this slight advantage of the more liberal cosmopolitan side by about a million or two but and this is changing as, as Michal was showing right the younger people are beginning to be more and more open to the world or are more open to the world uh, but it is going to be tough and I think that peace, will unfortunately play on the same instruments that they've used before that they they will that's the the the, the cast I, I uh, again Mihao points about professionalism they they are professional rebel rousers you know they 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 the rebel rousers they they are extremely good sometimes at at creating those emotional crises which then they say well we can solve them right and but i don't think they they have tools they don't have staff to change to a more kind of level-headed rational type of politics that you know think about how they were running all their campaigns this was anti-migrant and they were very instrumental right they were anti-migrants, then suddenly they were anti-women, right? And then they were anti-LGBTQ. Do that one on this famous or infamous slogan, LGBTQ is, is not people, but an ideology. He won, that's maybe important by one percentage, basically, over Trzaskowski. But nonetheless, again, it's kind of 50-50 country. And But I think they will be doing what they've been doing for many years and it's it's going to be tough it's not going to be pleasant in in terms of of the the uh the tenor of the public debate and even the debates in the same that sometimes they're already the level of discussion is sometimes dismal because of this emotionality but um i think the, we're we're coming down to three minutes um, so I just uh, maybe uh, we could go through each of our wonderful panelists. It's it's actually just so lovely to see um, colleagues who are so um, invigorated and so so eager to to contribute to the conversation with such such interesting insights. It's it's been a very rich discussion. But maybe we could just take a moment to step back and have some kind of let's just say wrap up thoughts. And I would ask um, perhaps each of you. Um, to to take out of the the conversation the, the most important things that you want our audience uh, to know, which is which is a, a mixture of, of various people with with um, ties directly to Poland, but also people are very much interested in the EU electoral pro processes and et cetera, et cetera. So um, maybe we go in the reverse order that we began, and Michał, you could uh, you could start us off. Okay, so wrap up. So it will be uh, difficult because we we talked we talked about too many a lot of things. So just uh, okay. So just to repeat what I said that we polls became very so much more um, progressive, much more open and um, uh, cult culturally, which which I believe it's it is reflected in your election results. And also what we observe is a. Uh, the, the, one of the factor um, determining election results is a mobilization of of young voters and mobilization of those who did not vote previously in previous elections. But also, just I would just add one thing: what what before um, what before uh, uh, Jan and Monica said that. Uh, so Tusk leadership was very important, but also moderates were important. I mean, this trzecia droga, uh, because without like th these are these are voters who are who were somewhere in between uh, law and hate towards. So they they didn't hate law and justice, but they didn't love also Tusk, and also uh, so they are like somewhere in between and. And the final success was uh, they were needed to have a final success, and also at the end of campaign, Tusk did not attack. They have like a pact of um, agreement, did not attack each other. So also having some moderates for revolution is also important. We observe it in 18, 19, uh, 89 that moderates were important, and also like here also here as well. But sorry for opening new avenue for discussion. But I would say I would finish here. 
Yeah, I, I would. So I guess it's my turn. Right? Yeah, reverse order. Okay. So um, I, I would say that, yes, uh, definitely the moderates, I think, will, you know, moderate politics of, you know, accountability and purges, which I hope do not happen. With one exception, though, with one ex and I'm, maybe it's maybe even purges are not necessary. But seriously, if you look at state television, or if you looked at state television in the last year in Poland, um, you know, th that institution like has to be changed. Now, I don't necessarily think that, you know, purge is unnecessary because I think that, you know, most of the people working there are just opportunists and, you know, like will say whatever they're paid to say. So, you know, so maybe, you know, one doesn't need as radical changes, but, but, but state media are so important, particularly in the Novosantras of the country where that's the only TV station. If you, if you went to a skiing resort or like a summer resort to any of you know the neighboring towns in the southeast, that is the 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 only television that you would be able to access. And you know it's it's impossible not to be brainwashed by it if that is the the main source of news that you consume. So um, so I feel that you know that 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 those those institutions should you know like be immediately attended to so that they just perform the the role that you know that journalism is supposed to and media are supposed to play just one sentence uh, Monica, it's very funny to look at uh, tv pub, public tv right now because i am watching them right now they are changing so this is really like a, a bit so they of are opportunists yeah okay <laughs> thank yeah. you well i guess my final thought is that Poland is back, baby, in the sense it is going to be a serious and respected player again in, in the EU and you know, in Brussels, European salons, and is going to be bringing a, a pretty digestible dishes to the table. But don't look to the kitchen. The kitchen is going to be a mess. That's still. I, I that, that is a, that is, that's a fantastic confused image poland is back baby but don't look at the kitchen that's that's right. that's i think where we have to end this but but i really um think that we have a lot of reason to look to bring this panel um back uh, maybe in a year from now to uh, reassess where we are uh and pavel i do you want to um, take us take us out of here well, I just can only say that it was, uh, I, I want to thank our speakers and uh, our guests. Um, thank you for your insights and thank you for, for the discussion. Um, thank, thanks to all the audience that was that was with us. Um, I hope we addressed your questions either in direct or less direct way. Um, and I just want to follow up and say that on in December in our conversations in Europe, we will, our guests will be Agnieszka Holland. So you will have an opportunity to take a closer look or have a first sight, first hand impressions about how what role her film played in the shift that we were just witnessing. So please join us in that event. Thank you, everyone. Um, have a good evening or have a good afternoon. And I hope to see you. We hope to see you next uh, next month in conversations in Europe. Goodbye. Thank you so much. Take Thank care. You. Thank Bye. you.